We're excited about having leaders from Atchison High School and Mar Hill Mount Academy High School, as well as students from Benedictine College and the Benedictine and Atchison community. Thank you all for being here. Today we have four very special guests on the Benedictine College campus. We're honored to have with us Bud Cray, former CEO and chair of MGP Ingredients, Inc., located here in Atchison, Kansas. Jim Farrell, former CEO of Farrell Gas, Inc., and chairman of the board of that publicly traded company. Michael Haverty, former CEO and current executive chairman of Kansas City Southern Railroad. And Tim Newkirk, the CEO of MGP Ingredients, Inc. here in Atchison. Tim. This is as big as an important event in the city of Atchison as we've had in a long time. Today on this stage, you'll hear from four men who lived in and grew up here in Atchison, Kansas, and who have risen to the top of the corporate world, becoming chief executive officers of publicly traded companies. To think that this city could produce such incredible talent that is sitting up here is a little overwhelming, actually. This is a time for reflection and aspiration. We've asked these leaders to reflect on success and leadership, to provide you wisdom on their keys to leadership and how they were able to rise to the levels that they did. This is also a time of aspiration. These leaders were you not too long ago. They lived here. They experienced the same things you're experiencing right now growing up in Atchison. And look, look at them now. They're living proof that through hard work, dedication, vision, sacrifice, education, a love of learning, willingness to take risks, willingness to stand up for what they think is right, even if, those, if there are those who disagree with them, can make you successful. I want you to hear their stories, and if you walk away from this program with aspirations to be like Bud Cray, or Jim Farrell, or Mike Haverty, or Tim Newkirk, then this was a successful program. This is an especially significant day for Benedictine College. Three of these men, Bud Cray, Jim Farrell, and Mike Haverty, have been generous to the college to the point that they have buildings named after them on our campus. I'm sure there are some people here today who live in Farrell Hall, or the newly named Cray Seberg Hall, and everyone has seen the beautiful Haverty Center. In addition, most of our entrepreneurial programs, including Raven Rock, Holy Grounds, and the award-winning SIFE program, are run out of the Cray Center for Entrepreneurship. I believe this may be the first time we've ever had all three of them on campus at the same time. So thank you for your generosity and past support. Mr. Newkirk has also been generation, well, yes. Mr. Newkirk has also been generation, generous to the college in setting up internships for our students down at MGP and scholarship support for our students too. And so we thank you, for, Tim, for your leadership in that as well. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to explain how this program was devised. We, de we decided to invite people of Atchison that had risen to the level of CEO of a publicly traded company. There are four. A publicly traded company is one in which their stock is traded on one of the public exchanges, such as the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. Many of you have heard the term, the market, uh, such as the market is up today, or the Great Depression began when the market crashed. The market is made up of publicly traded stocks that you can buy and sell. In fact, because of the faith I have in each of these people on stage, I personally own stock in each of their companies. So each, so I hope you're doing a good job. Uh, so, so each of these men run or ran companies whose stock can be bought and sold on the open market. With that introduction, let us begin. I want to introduce each of these people, and they will, be given, they will provide you with their views on leadership. When all four are done, we will open up the floor for questions. About 10.55, uh, because of the high school students will need to leave, we will break. And if there are additional questions from the audience for those who are staying, we can do that as well. So without further ado, let me introduce Bud Cray. Cloud L. Bud Cray is the former longtime chief executive officer and chairman of the board of MGP Ingredients, Inc. in Atchison, Kansas. Many of you have seen their offices at the bottom of 2nd Street or their plant on Main Street here in Atchison. After earning a degree in chemical engineering from Case Institute of Technology, now known as Case Western, in Cleveland, 
he, where he graduated with honors in 1943, but Cray accepted a position with Dow Chemical Corporation. He spent summer breaks, however, working for MGP here in Atchison, which his father founded in 1941. In 1944, he was drafted into the U.S. Army and served our country before being honorably discharged in 1946. Bud Cray joined MGPI as a full-time executive in 1947 and became president of the company in 1962 and became chief executive officer and chairman of the board in 1980. Just prior to MGP being sold on the NASDAQ exchange in 1988, he handed over the reins as chief executive officer to Lad Seberg, but remained as chair. Over the last 70 years, Bud has directly influenced the company's growth from an antiquated one-plant operation with annual sales of about $10 million to a state-of-the-art multi-plant complex that generates close to $400 million in sales in 2008. His Bud's civic contributions and professional involvement within the city of Atchison is legendary. In, in, in addition to that, in 1981, Bud and his late wife Sally established the Cray Medical Research Foundation at KU Medical Center. Every major event that we've had in Atchison, Bud Cray has had an opportunity to lead. If I were to spend, all, we could spend all day talking about all the events that he's done, all the, the campaigns that he's chaired. He's, he's, he is constantly working to make Atchison a better place to live, and we're, for that, we're forever grateful. He's been a strong supporter of the college and significantly supported every campaign that we've had here at the college as well. Bud's first resident in, residence in Atchison, Kansas, was actually a house called the Snowden House, which is the house I live in today. It's the president's house on our campus. He has lived on a plot of ground now called Potato Hill for over 60 years. His lovely wife, Sally, just recently passed away. They raised their daughters here in Atchison, one of whom is Karen Seberg, who was recently awarded, along with her husband, Lad, the Cross of the Order of St. Benedict at the Scholarship Ball. Bud has received the same award from the college. Let us welcome Bud Cray. I was manager of the company before the day of, of uh, computers. Therefore, the only way I could find out what was going around on, on in the company was to go through the company each and every day. For that reason, I knew probably every person in the company by his first name or her first name. Uh, communication came easy. But, it, but in my opinion, you have to have it. I think a good example is, uh, is right now in our country. If, if people, in other words, if people pass laws behind closed doors and don't let people know about what's going on, they're going to lose confidence in leadership. I think that same thing happens in a company. If they don't know what is going on and why, they can't follow that leader. Um, I've always been an optimist. I think it's a great characteristic for a leader to have. Because obviously in 70 years, there were many critical times in our company uh, when we could have either succeeded or failed. In those times, I considered it my job to keep everybody positive. I, I never lost confidence in the future. And uh, therefore, I talked that way to my people. I think it's very important because people will follow a leader who has confidence in the future. You better, if you're a leader, you better get used to change. If you don't change, then the change will come anyhow. I can remember every time I came back from a management seminar, my entire staff groaned and said, oh my God, what idea will Bud Cray come back with this time? But I did, and some of those ideas were brilliant, some of them were good, some of them hardly worked at all. But we did keep our company up with change. I want to say one more thing. If you want to be a leader, Get into something you enjoy. Because this idea of business is just like a game. You've all been in games and you know how, you, how much you enjoy winning. Well, 
It's the same thing in business. You want to survive. And if you enjoy what you're doing, it doesn't even seem like you're working. It just seems like you're uh, doing what you ought to be doing. If you do all of those things, I'm almost 90 years old now. I hope you will end up exactly like I have been, having had a very rewarding life, but an enjoyable one as well. Thank you. Cray. Thank you, Mr. Cray. That's fantastic. Next, I want to introduce Mr. Farrell. Jim Farrell is the executive chairman of Farrell Gas Partners, a master limited partnership that trades on the New York Stock Exchange. Farrell Gas is primarily engaged in the retail distribution of propane gas and related equipment and supplies throughout the United States and Puerto Rico. And through its Blue Rhino business, Farrell Gas also is the nation's largest provider of propane by portable tank exchange. Many of you may have seen the Blue Rhino tanks that you use for gas grills, right? Have you seen this? It's Mr. Farrell's company. And also, you see the little truck in front there. You may have seen that truck delivering propane to in rural areas. So when you see this, you'll know who's in charge, okay, Mr. Farrell. And so we're honored to have him with us today. Mr. Farrell entered the tiny family propane business in 1965. Through his strategy of planned growth through acquisition, Farrell Gas has grown over the years be, to be one of the nation's largest retail marketers of propane with sales of over $2 billion. The company is headquartered in Overland Park, Kansas. Mr. Farrell has also had other business interests and managed his, uh, man, by managing his unrelated Farrell Capital Office, which is based in Leewood, including a community bank and dental management company. He also owned an international trading business based in London until about two years ago. Jim and his wife, Elizabeth or Zibby have two married daughters and six grandchildren. The Farrells have been extremely supportive of Benedictine College and spearheaded the campaign, campaign to renovate Farrell Hall, one of the nicest and most, most unique residence halls in the country. Jim grew up in a small house on 617 South 6th Street, two houses north on the west side from R Street. He graduated from Atchison High School and the University of Kansas. The college has honored Mr. Farrell and his wife Zibby with the Cross of the Order of St. Benedict and honorary degrees. Let us welcome Jim Farrell. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve knows if I do it extemporaneously, it'll take too long. So I wrote something out, and I, uh, you'll have to bear with me here. I was born in 1939 to parents who had lost their farm in the Depression and had just moved to a tiny house in South Atchison, not far from the convent school that we simply knew as the Mount. My mother had been a country one-room school teacher, and she believed deeply in education and in America as the land of opportunity. Dad came from a long line of farmers, but became a salesman to support his family. Right after World War II, he opened his own store on Atchison's Commercial Street back when the town was vibrant. That means back before Walmart. I, I was a uh, model student, a model student until my mother died when I was 12. From then on, I was more or less on my own because Dad worked most of the time and my grades went south. I did get a high school diploma, but that's about it. There was no money for me to go on to college, and I got a job. That winter, it finally dawned on me if I wanted to make something out of myself, I had to get a college degree. And so I worked my way through KU. I had two full-time jobs back-to-back -back in the summertime and one in the winter. That's where all the money came from, and in about four and a half years, I graduated. I also signed up for Army ROTC because I didn't want to be drafted and because I really wanted to serve. Patriotism was alive and well then. In 1963, I graduated with a degree in business, was commissioned a second lieutenant in the infantry, and sent to Fort Benning, Georgia for schooling. Until then, I had just been working hand-to-mouth with no life plan and no idea what leadership was. I had chosen the infantry for my branch assignment because all my life I have chosen action. It matches up with me very well. The infantry slogan is simply, follow me. And the basic officers course is the best leadership school in the world, but only if you soak it up. 
I put all my effort into that school, and I ended up graduating second in the class academically with a special award for being the most proficient student. That pen set, the first thing I'd ever won in my life, still sits on my desk. Then I got lucky again. I was assigned to a crack infantry battalion as a platoon leader. My CO was perfect for me. He taught me and developed me and protected me when I got into trouble, which unfortunately happens when you take chances. A year later, when I rotated out, there were hard-earned decorations on my chest. In other words, I had, tasted, I had tasted success. My confidence could not have been higher. But back home here on leave, my father unexpectedly asked me to come back and help him. His business was failing and he was tired. Six months later, more out of loyalty to my father than anything else, I left the Army. My wife and I took a small apartment here in Atchison. I was just a young 26-year-old who, because of recent success in the Army, thought he could do about anything. But after I dug into what I'd bitten off this time, I, I figured out how daunting this task was going to be. Feral Gas was then doing business from a 15-foot by 15-foot shack on the other side of the river in East Atchison. The, uh, the, the, the store was long gone. Sales were $200,000 a year and had not made money for years. Debt was more than the business could be sold for. My sister likes to say, most people start with nothing. My brother started in the hole. I did everything. Sold, installed, delivered gas. I can remember delivering gas to Bud Cray here, still a customer, and, uh, and collected. Didn't have to collect from Bud. Bud paid his bill. I knew how to grow. I knew I had to grow this business or give up, and I wasn't about to give up, so I worked harder than I'd ever worked in my life. The clock was ticking for the business and for me. I inherently just knew that, and slowly profitability returned. Three years later, after I had come, three years after I'd come back, I made my first acquisition, a tiny nearby competitor. It cost all of $25,000. 100% borrowed from a bank in St. Joe who was just happy to get rid of the last guy that owned the little business. Now, roll forward from that 26 years, from that small step to 1994. By then, I had made over 200 acquisitions, borrowing millions. Feral gas was nationwide. It had over 4,000 employees, 1,600 locations, and over a billion dollars in sales. That year, I took it public on the New York Stock Exchange. Today, 46 years after I took the reins of Feral Gas, I'm executive chairman. It's a lot better than being CEO because I don't have to worry about things at night anymore. And uh, the business is run by a very talented, homegrown young man. We are in every continental state and still growing. Sales exceed $2 billion now. It has, been, it has the most modern operating system in the industry, designed primarily like me. It makes the business look more like a FedEx business than anything. Blue Rhino, you just heard about Blue Rhino, and Blue Rhino's around in, in many places, well better well known than, than Feral Gas, sells almost 20 million of those little bottles every year through 50,000, over 50,000 selling locations. So looking back from this vantage point at my age, advanced age, I should say, uh, what have I done with my life? First of all, I got an education. Secondly, I became a leader. I served my country for a short time. I built my father's business basically from zero to now, and up until two or three years ago, I operated a large international trading business in London. We took large cargoes of propane and butane from producing countries like Saudi Arabia to importing countries like Japan. I have been and still am, and other businesses will be always be, be remembered as the guy in the propane business. In fact, the only one who ever went from mom and pop to large company CEO. But why I'm most proud of is that I developed many people along the way. I've certainly given a great many a good place to work. And I started, like you may start, with any number of handicaps. I had absolutely no money. In fact, I owed money on my car, which was my only tangible asset. I came from a small town in the middle of the country Trust me, New York City looks down on us as quaint provincials out here. And in truth, there are a lot smarter people than me in the world. 
I wasn't a West Point graduate, but I did well in the Army. I don't have to tell you that propane is far from being the sexiest business in the world. And I only speak middle American English, yet I have done business all over the world. I grew up thinking that other people, even those who lived just across the river in Missouri, were somehow different from me and even a little scary. Even old people in suits were different, definitely different from me. Now I have friends and associates all over the world, and I am an old guy in a suit. I didn't realize it when I was your age, but I also had some things going for me that uh, you will realize later. Great parents and a value-added, a value-based upbringing. And I also worked harder than anyone else. I also never stopped learning. And while I have been scared plenty of times, I seem to like action and adventure. So, how about you? Let's talk about you for a minute. The topic of the day is leadership. I already told you that the first thing I did after getting an education was to become a leader. So what do I think that is? There are so many ways to look at leadership that a book gets written almost every day on the subject. In fact, it's all pretty simple. First of all, you're a leader if people are following you. If you check back there and no one is there, you aren't a leader. Either you persuade others to follow or you don't. A leader, if nothing else, is persuasive. But to me, you also need to live like the leader you want to be. Not all leaders are my kind. Hitler, Stalin, Gaddafi quickly come to everyone's mind. But there are plenty of other wrong-headed leaders right here in America in all walks of life. For what I like are value-driven leaders with common sense and who care about people. I also want leaders who develop people, teaching, not just telling. The classic leader is a patent-style dictator who just tells people what to do. You're going to meet many of those uh, throughout your life. But the very best leader is the teacher and the team builder. You won't like this one, but you have to look like a leader. Dress the way you want to be seen, who you want to be. You see me up here today in a dark suit, white shirt, and a tie. Groom as you want to be seen. I'm a good example of what that means. Clean shaven, no tattoos, no facial rings, no long hair. A few people don't have, don't have to do all of this. There are some people who can get by with it. You see, you see them on television once in a while, uh, people who have developed large companies. But why take a chance that you're as talented or as lucky as them? You're going to be judged by how you carry yourself, what you say, your accent, where you came from, and where you went to school. You say that's not fair. Affairs got nothing to do with it. People who succeed look and act like they belong. And you will always be judged by who you surround yourself with, your friends, your associates, and your employees. I define a leader as someone who takes people where they would not go by themselves. That involves responsibility, decisions, and personal risk. A true leader must be courageous because he is always at risk. A true leader is best in traumatic situations. Anyone can pretend to be a leader when things are good, like a strutting parade ground soldier. But the measurement of who you are is when the chips are down. I hate trauma, but I'm very good at dealing with it. I have had any number of people work for me whose mind turned to mush when things hit the fan. You can be in a leadership position and not be a leader. You don't cause change and you never develop your people. And when the chips are down, you collapse. A case in point right now is in Japan where the CEO of the electric company with the nukes melting down is in the hospital with a nervous breakdown. He held the position but never was a leader. A leader listens, decides, and then convinces others that he knows the way. By that, I mean he knows what to do. 
Knowing the way requires some intelligence and some ideas, or at least you are able to latch onto the ideas of others and push them forward. And you must have the courage of your convictions in order to act. If a fire broke out right now here in this room, I would hope that someone would jump up in a commanding voice and yell out, follow me, leading us to the closest exit. If not, chaos would develop. A true leader eliminates chaos. What he does is instill hope in people that he knows, that he knows the way out of whatever the situation is. But a leader is also held accountable for his or her actions. If our leader in my imaginary fire took us to the janitor's closet instead of outside, we would abandon him right then and there, and a new leader would emerge. Look, I don't know who you are. I don't know what talents came with you. I don't know what your ambitions are. I don't know what you, th what you think life is all about. And I don't know how confident you are, how brave you are, and how smart you are. But you should still learn and then apply the rules of leadership. Why not try to be a leader? All it really means is trying to make a difference with the life you've been given. And yes, it was given. You did not have to be born. It was a gift. Make something out of that gift. Your legacy will be what you tried to do, not what you actually accomplished. Yet if you choose to live this way, you will fail from time to time. That's the nature of risk. No one gets it right all the time. I've been wrong so many times I have lost count. What I didn't ever do was give up and crawl into a hole. I picked myself up and continued to move forward. Leaders conquer fear. Your perceived and or real handicaps will not stop you. Only the choices you make will stop you. Hard work, optimism, and honesty will bring breaks for you just as mine did. Look for the doors of opportunity and open them, not to the illogic of I can't because. The only two things you cannot choose for yourself are to whom you were born and where you were born. Otherwise, it's all in your hands. Everything else is within your control. Besides, this is still the land of opportunity and the only one in the world. If you think about it, you've already hit the jackpot by being born here. Western civilization, not just America, depends on leaders. Leaders from young people just like you who grow up with middle American values. Values I believe to be the remnants of what really built the world we live in. The elite may think otherwise, but they're wrong. Someday, after I am long gone, I expect you to be up here giving this same talk. I say go for it. The world is counting on you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. In getting prepared for this, I had a conversation with Mr. Farrell, and he indicated that he actually walked to high school until he was a junior and then bought his first car for $15. Is that right? That's a, that was a pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah, I know. Michael Haverty is a fourth generation railroader. His great grandfather came out to help build the railroad here in, and settled here in Atchison. He began his railroad career with the Missouri Pacific Railroad Company in 1963 as a brakeman right down in the rail yard at the bottom of the bridge there at the casting company or Bradkin at the foot of the bridge. Isn't that right, Mike? He was identified early for having leadership potential and completed his management training program in 1967 following his graduation from college. In 1970, he moved to the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway, and he held various operating positions before serving as president of Santa Fe Railroad in, in 1989. In 1995, he was named as the CEO of Kansas City Southern Railway Company. And upon, upon joining Kansas City Southern, Mr. Haverty be, began assembling the pieces to fulfill his vision to expand into Mexico which would help secure the company's future. Everyone told him it couldn't be done. 
You see in front of Mr. Haverty there is a model of an engine of Kansas City Southern Railway. You see that car a lot of times in Atchison, that, that engine and the beautifully painted cars that follow it. And so that when you see that, you'll know that that's Mr. Haverty's company. Mr. Haverty's determination is clearly in, illustrated in the obstacles and successes achieved in Mexico under his leadership. Kansas City Southern now operates lines north and south into Mexico and into the United States and is one of the most profitable railway companies in America. Mr. Haverty was named Railway Ages Magazine's Railroader of the Year and also Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year for his work at Kansas City Southern. Mr. Haverty is involved in the Kansas City community sitting on several boards. Mr. Haverty was born and raised in Atchison, Kansas. Although he has moved over 30 times in his life with the railroad, he still considers Atchison his foundation and his native home. He grew up in a house on 14th in Kansas, a block or two east of the parish and grade school that he attended Sacred Heart. He graduated from Mar Hill and has supported the Haverty Scholarship Program there. Mr. Haverty has also been generous to Benedictine College and we have honored him with the naming of the Haverty Center and an honorary degree. He's a very good football player at Mar Hill and came to Benedictine to play football, but transferred after his freshman year when we dropped the sport. He graduated from the University of Louisiana Lafayette, received a master's degree in business administration from the University of Chicago. He's married, has three children, six grandchildren, resides in Mission Hills, Kansas with his wife, Marlis. Let us welcome Mike Haverty. Thank you very much, Steve, and it's certainly a great pleasure to be back here in my hometown where I was born and raised and started uh, my railroad career 48 years ago uh, this uh, June. Uh, also, I am honored to be a part of this panel here with these real leaders from Matchison uh, that have done such a great job uh, for this community. And finally, let me say that uh, uh, Benedictine is displaying its own leadership here. I think it's just great that they bring together public schools and Catholic schools here for this event today. So I think that Benedictine is displaying itself as a leader, an academic institution in this region, bringing all the different uh, high schools uh, together. Before I say any comments uh, about leadership, let me talk about uh, success, because I think you have to be successful before you become a leader. Does that mean that you have to be a chairman, a CEO, an owner of a company, president of college, a governor, president of the United States, multi-millionaire or billionaire to be successful? Is that, the, is that the definition of success? No. I think that what you have to do is you have to achieve happiness and satisfaction in your own life. And what you have to do is you have to have a reasonable, economically secure position so that you can provide for yourself and for your family and your country, and also so that you can help institutions that will help change this world and maybe help those that are not as successful as you are. To me, that's the definition of success, not how much money you have and how high you reach uh, in a certain position. That's the, not the definition of success. So what are the keys to success? Number one, uh, and Bud Gray talked about this, you got to enjoy what you do. You cannot go to work every day and be miserable. You have to love what you do. I started in the railroad business 48 years ago, brakeman switchman this afternoon. I'm going to fly to Meridian, Mississippi and get on a train and with another group from another railroad and go from Meridian to Shreveport, Louisiana. This is what I love. I get up every day and I love what I do. That's what you need to do to be successful. You need to find what it is that you enjoy. Also, you have to work hard. Jim Farrell talked about that. If you think that you can go and just kind of be leisurely and everything's going to work out and so on, that's not the way it is. There's a tremendous amount of competition in the world today. And those that strive and work hard, those are the ones that are successful. Also, you have to set goals and you have to stay focused and you have to say, stay persistent. Uh, Steve knows how I feel about determination. In fact, I say those 
of the three keys to success, determination, determination, determination. You have to decide what it is you want to do, and then you need to stay focused. I am a believer that anybody can do anything that they want if they set their mind to it, and you can do anything you want if you really are focused and that's what you want to do. It's been alluded to up here, you have to be honest. You have to do the right thing. Because if you're not honest and if you don't do the right thing, in my opinion, what you have done is basically sold your soul. People will understand that you will compromise, that you will give in. And it doesn't necessarily have to be illegal, but you're going to be tempted many times to not do the right thing. I suggest to you that you have to do the right thing. One other thing I would say to you is you never get too high, you never get too low. So when things are going good, don't be up there high-fiving everybody and this is all great and so on because life is a series of ups and downs and you're going to find that sometimes things are good and sometimes they're bad. So when they're good, don't get too high. When they're bad, don't get too low. And finally, to be successful, you need some luck, some good breaks, or some good fortune. But I will tell you that I've found that good luck comes very... Uh, many times uh, with hard work. The harder you work, the better luck you have. Having said that, I will say that I have found over my career there are some things that I have not been able to explain that have happened. I would say it goes beyond good luck or good fortune. In fact, I refer to it as divine intervention. There are times that I've wondered if our company sometimes was going to survive. I went to bed at night and wondered if I got up the next day if it would still be there but something somewhere a higher being seemed to step in and make things work out so you need some of that and I'll tell you I still strongly believe in God and I think that that's why some of those things have have happened why I've had some good fortune now let me talk about uh, leadership the question always comes up are you a born leader or are leaders made I happen to believe it's a combination of both. I think that there are certain tendencies that you are born with that would lead a person to be a leader. However, I've seen a lot of people in my lifetime that had potential to be leaders that failed. They ended up, they got on drugs, alcohol, and they ruined their lives and so on. And or maybe they became a leader of a drug gang or some kind of a criminal organization or whatever. That's not the definition of being a leader. A leader is someone that is doing the right thing and over time develops and becomes more and more of a leader and is more and more respected as they go on. I will also say to you that you must lead by example. You cannot tell people to go out and do something that you would not do yourself. I have found that out that that is absolutely critical. I don't care what kind of title you have you get up there and say, do what I say, you know, they have to understand that you would do that yourself. That's a real mark of a leader. And also, as was alluded to here, I think, by Jim Farrell, you cannot be afraid to fail. I'm not saying that you need to be a riverboat gambler and go out and do stupid things, but nobody bats a thousand in life. And if you sit back and you don't take chances and you wait and say, well, I'm not going to do that, uh, because I might fail, then I'll tell you what, you will not be successful. Because through those failures, you learn from experience in those failures, and that's what helps you become successful. Uh, one other thing I would say to you, that respect is more important as a leader than winning a popularity contest. If you think you can go out and be friends with everybody, and everybody's going to get along, and you're going to hold hands and all that stuff, that's not what a leader does. You're not out to win a popularity contest. Sometimes you have to do things that are not popular. And you know, if you look back at one of the greatest presidents of our time, Harry Truman, and when he left office, he was a person that was not rated very high. But if you look back, he did what he believed was right. He stayed with what he believed was right. And I'll tell you what, he got great respect and he's now considered is one of the great leaders of our time. One other thing you have to learn to say no as a leader. You can't always say yes. 
You know, you can't always be the good person and say, oh, yeah. Sometimes you have to stand up and you have to say no. Uh, you cannot compromise your ethics or your principles. That just doesn't work. You know, I mean, it just, it, that you, you can't do that. I alluded to that in being successful. That's also the case in being a leader. I had a guy tell me the other day, we were talking about one of our politicians. I'll leave that person's name unnamed, but I said that that person does not tell the truth and they don't have credibility. And he said, well, you know, what you don't understand is, you know, people will, and politicians will say things and then things will change, you know, a couple of months later. So it's, they have to say something different. I said, wait a minute, I'm from Kansas. You know what? When I say something, that's the way it is. I'm not going to tell you something and then two months later tell you something different. You know, you've got to stay by your word and what you say has got to be uh, the way it is. Um, also, it's important that you listen to others. Nobody is a dictator. Nobody's God. You don't have all the answers. Not one person runs anything. It is a group of people, and you have to listen to what others say. You have to listen to their input. In the final analysis, you may have to make the decision. And you've listened to all kinds of people and say, okay, this is the way we're going to do it. That's the mark of a leader, but a leader also listens uh, to uh, people. Uh, you need to learn to accept responsibility. If you make a mistake, stand up and say you made a mistake. That's the one thing that irritates me so much today in our political environment. Everybody wants to blame everybody else, and nobody will stand up and say we made a mistake. And if you're going to be a leader, you have to be able to admit that you were wrong. Uh, finally, uh, what you need to do is you need to s spread the credit and acknowledge those that contributed. It's not always, I did this and I did that and so on. As I say, it takes a lot of people to make things happen. And if you're going to be a real leader, you have to acknowledge those people. And if you acknowledge those people, they will become very loyal and they will do things and they will help you achieve what you want to be. And to me, that's a very important thing in being a leader. Okay, with that, I thank you, and uh, I look forward to uh, any questions we may have uh, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Haverty. There's a common theme here. Hard work is important. My middle son last summer, teenager, asked me, tell me, uh, Dad, what's the one secret to success? The one secret. And I said, hard work. And he said, you got anything else? And I said, no, that's it. <laughs> that's the one secret is hard work. And every one of these are testaments to that. Mr. Haverty one time sent me this quote from Calvin Coolidge and sums up his life. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are all powerful. And that uh, sums up Mr. Haverty. I want to introduce Timothy Newkirk. Mr. Newkirk has served as the CEO of MGP Ingredients since March 2008, making him only the fourth person to hold that title, including Mr. Bud Cray, his father, and Lad Seberg. He began his career with MGPI in 1991, serving initially as a distillery shift manager and later as a process engineer, project engineer, and quality control manager at the company's Atchison plant and then was the manager of the Pekin, Illinois plant in 1997. In the spring of 2000, he accepted a, a position with another company, High Plains Corporation, and moved up uh, the latter in that company as well until being called back to Atchison to uh, head up MGPI in 2005. Mr. Newkirk began, ser uh, began serving as the president of the Board of Education here in Atchison as well and is on the board of the Atchison Community Education Foundation and a member of the Board of Directors of Union State Bank. 
Mr. Newkirk spent most of his youth in Atchison and graduated from Atchison High School in 1986 and I believe was a member of one or two state basketball champions. So as in Atchison High Gymnasium, you'll see his name on the banner up there, Tim Newkirk. So look for that. And he was also a track star as well, as I recall. Uh, he received a degree in engineering management for the University of Missouri Rolla in 1991, or Missouri S&T, I think is what it's called, and earned a master's degree in business administration at the Olin School of Business at Washington University. One interesting fact is that Tim and his family moved to Atchison before high school because his father was the general manager of the food service for Benedictine College. For, uh, so Ned Price's sons have something to look forward to. Uh, thank you for being here, Tim, and let's welcome Tim Newkirk. Thank you, Steve. Uh, first, I'd, before I get started, I'd like to thank uh, President Minnis and Benedictine College for this incredible opportunity to talk about a subject I'm most passionate about, probably one of any subject to talk about, and that's leadership. I guess before I get started to kind of round out the whole house thing, uh, we grew up on Fifth Street, a block north of, uh, of the uh, middle school, and today actually, so the whole house thing comes full closure, because it's probably the only real reason I'm up here, is we live in the house that... Uh, Bud's father built um, when they when they moved to town formally in the early 50s. So we all kind of have the, the house thing going. Um, I want to say right up front that I'm truly humbled to be included in this panel of excellent leaders who have demonstrated their leadership acumen over an entire career. When President Minnis asked me if I would be a part of this panel, first I thought he was kidding. Um, then I told him I would love to be in the audience and take notes, uh, but wasn't sure I had earned the right to speak about leadership, especially considering the incredible careers the gentlemen that have already spoken have had. Nonetheless, you're stuck with listening to me, um, and I will share some of my thoughts on what I believe in today's business world to be a more precious commodity than capital, innovation, or growth opportunities, and that's leadership. First, I will define leadership and discuss a couple of examples why I think leadership is so important. Then I'll talk about how I believe you can build your leadership ability in everyday interactions. Finally, I'll close with an example from my high school days that was pivotal in galvanizing my understanding about the importance of leadership. So let's start off with a simple definition. So where do you go? Well, you guys Google. I go to Webster's Dictionary. And Webster's defines leadership as the ability to guide, direct, or influence people, and I think that's a common theme you've heard from everyone. Leadership is about people. In my very limited experience, I would suggest that leadership is the key ingredient in any successful endeavor. We have all seen athletic teams with incredible individual talent fail to reach their potential. Conversely, we've seen teams with good, but not incredible talent, achieve more than anyone thought possible. All you have to do is watch March Madness in today's day and age and you see it. Think about Butler, think about VCU. You may argue luck can also play a part in this unexpected over or under achievement, but I believe the more important differentiator is really leadership. So imagine the world 234 years ago. How would you have handicapped a confrontation between a ragtag, economically unsophisticated, individualistic group of people called Americans fighting against one of the world's two superpowers in Great Britain? The Americans were outmanned, outgunned, economically inferior, and completely unorganized. The British, as you remember, were battle-tested, an economic superpower, well-organized, and well-versed in managing their far-flung empire. Yet we all know how this confrontation ended. Why? Let's go back to the very definition of leadership for a clue. We define leadership as the ability to guide, direct, or influence people. America's early leaders, men like Franklin, Jefferson, Adams, Washington, Payne, Hancock, and many others, demonstrated a much higher level of leadership than the leaders of the British Empire. These early leaders were not only able to fashion an army out of farmers, artisans, and shopkeepers, but also were able to bring the spirit of the American people together by guiding, directing, and influencing each American into believing the American idea of government of the people, by the people, for the people, was not only a great idea, but was worth fighting for. So this is why leadership is and should be important to you. It is only through effective leadership that we are able to accomplish great things. 
After talking about such great American leaders as Jefferson, Washington, Hancock, and others, it can give one the idea that leadership is a noble gift from God bestowed upon some inexplicably chosen few. While I believe that is true for this elite group of leaders like Washington, Lincoln, and Churchill, as Mr. Haverty said, I believe the kind of leadership business and really the world needs today is more of a universal leadership that each one of us can acquire through a thoughtful honing of those three skills, guiding, directing, and influencing people. I can tell you leadership is the key ability we are recruiting at MGPI. And as I have discussed with many other presidents and CEOs, it is the one ability we all wish we had more of. So why should you care? Because if you develop this ability to lead, you will have a competitive advantage in the marketplace over those that don't. So how does one hone this ability to guide, direct, and influence people? I believe leadership is a developed skill based on one's desire to understand people, what motivates them to action. You need to understand cause and effect. You need to understand the value of listening to other perspectives and encouraging diversity of thought and experiences. And, and you've heard this from everyone, having the strength of your convictions to take a stand or make a decision supported by the evidence that you believe provides the best opportunity for the optimal outcome. <clears throat> Excuse me. To be fair, that last idea is full of great big concepts, but that is the ironic part of developing this ability that we call leadership. It is a lot of big concepts, but in the end, it is simply about being willing to do something that will inspire people to act in a way that is different than the status quo. So let's put this into practice. Think about a class discussion or a practice for an extracurricular activity or an interaction with a classmate. In each of these instances, you have the choice to go with the flow or lead the discussion, activity, or interaction in the way that you would like to see it go. Too many people today wait around to see what direction the majority want to go and then mindlessly follow, but that is the opposite of leadership. The example that galvanized leadership for me came from my participation on the Atchison High School basketball team. My junior year, we won the 4A state basketball championship. As we started the defense of our championship my senior year, I had a particularly good season opening tournament. However, once we got into the regular season, I was not getting as much playing time as I thought I deserved. I made an appointment to talk to my coach, Chick Downing, and what he told me really helped me understand how leadership works. He told me that in order for our team to have the best chance to repeat as state champions, he didn't need me to score points in the game or for me to even get significant minutes. Now you can imagine, I was less than excited to hear that message. Nobody likes sitting on the bench. But he went on to say that I had a very important role and that if I would accept my role, we would have a great shot at being back-to-back -back state champions. Chick said my role was to lead, lead in the classroom, by guiding and influencing my classmates to make the necessary grades, stay out of trouble, and demonstrate good citizenship. Lead in practice by winning every sprint, toughening up our center, and by giving 110% of practice every single day. The leadership lesson here is that leadership is not just scoring the most points or leading during the game time, but leadership is also necessary behind the scenes. Yes, we had great players and great court leadership, but I do believe without the off-court leadership, we may not have repeated to state champions. This is a simple and straightforward example of leadership, but I hope you can see it as an example of the many ways in our daily interactions in which you can begin to develop this important ability that we call leadership. In closing, it is my sincere hope that after you leave here, you spend some time thinking about all that you have heard this morning. Honing your leadership ability may be the one single thing that allows you to develop your personal competitive advantage for the rest of your life. Thank you. That was fantastic. I think one of my favorite things when we had a discussion about this time with Tim, he had indicated that when he was in eighth grade, they asked him to write a paper on three different professions that he thought he'd want to be uh, after he uh, graduated from college and, or the three different professions he thought he might pursue. His three were lawyer, pilot, and president of MGPI. So uh, that's kind of scary, don't you think? It's pretty great. Thank you, Tim.
a, a change in feral gas where uh, I, the, the industry, this propane gas industry, is full of little guys, full of uh, some 5,000 little guys, and the industry in general still operates the way they always operated. Uh, even the big companies do that, where the uh, drivers are kind of in control of where they go. We don't really control a lot of what happens. And I got tired of that about 10 years ago and decided that we were going to uh, put a system in that would put us in control of the business, get us in control of our, our pricing, get us in control of our uh, deliveries, get us to the point where we, as I said earlier, look like FedEx. Uh, that essentially turned the company upside down because instead of people in the field deciding what they're going to do, the company is able to decide what it's going to do. Well, the first thing you have to do if you're going to make a change like that, you've got to make damn sure you're right because this is, uh, this is going to be traumatic. Uh, but I could see what I did was study what other companies had done, not in the propane business, but what other companies had done to improve their productivity and get control of their business. And, and I hired a consultant to come in and help us with it, who I eventually fired because consultants, I never had much use for them, and I have less today. But <laughs> I uh, ended up doing it myself. But as a result, if it turned out right, it was the right thing to do. If it turned out wrong, if I destroyed the company, it was the wrong thing to do. Well, we are today delivering, we, we, we're, we're producing 25%, no, 50% more in cash flow than we were before with 25% fewer people. We have 40% fewer vehicles on the road because we're more efficient about, we're exceptionally efficient. We have the lowest operating cost. We have the, I mean, it's worked out, we have the best, uh, the best delivery system, best customer service in the industry. Now, it cost, it cost $100 million to do all of this. And part of that was uh, changing out one heck of a lot of people. If you're right and people don't want to follow you, they're mired in the old way, and you've got to remember people are always vested in the way it's being done now, and you want to do it a different way, you're probably going to end up changing a lot of people, which is what Mr. Haverty was saying. And in the end, if, you, if it worked, you were right. If it didn't work, you were wrong. This is the risk, the risk of leadership. You're going to take people somewhere where they're not going to go by themselves. And if you do it wrong and get them all killed, you know, you really screwed up. But if you did it right, everybody's so proud, so happy at the end that you look like a hero. So I'm a hero. <laughs> Mr. Havity's yeah. a hero. Yeah. I was, could I, have been I a do, goat. I do want uh, Tim and Bud to address this question, too, because back in 2008, uh, before the, cra the market crashed, uh, they, uh, the company was trading around $20, $25 a share, went down to $0.50, cents, and now it's on its way back. And changes had to be made. Is that right, uh, Tim and Bud? And I might have Bud uh, address that a little bit, and then, Tim, I want you to follow up, and then we'll let these folks go. Obviously, I've been uh, retired now for 20 years, so uh, I'll let Tim take up the problems that we went into a couple years ago. But answering your question, my engineering experience did one wonderful thing for me. It said, hey, any problem can be solved. And, and in answer to what I would do in your question, first I would analyze it myself and try to de decide what should be done. Then I would go out and find the people that would follow me. That's the way I would solve almost any problem that would come along. And we've had plenty of them, of course. In 70 years, we've had plenty of them. And I go along with what all of these other gentlemen have said. 
you really need to stay with it. Yes, you have to work hard, but you have to work right. And my dad gave me one very good advice. He said, Bud, to survive, to succeed, you're going to have to take risks. The one thing I would advise you, don't take a risk that can destroy your company. I've tried to live by that particular advice. That's good. Tim? Yeah, um, I, I think in our particular instance, um, you know, the, uh, the world changed a lot faster than we changed, and, and so we had to make some, some big changes. We have half the number of employees that we had in 2008. Our cash flow is, is probably twice what it used to be. Um, we're completely out of debt. We paid down almost $45 million in debt in just a little over 14 or 15 months. Um, but, but I have to agree. I mean, doesn't it stand to reason that if, this is, if leadership is all about people, that it's, that it's a people problem. I mean, rarely is, it, rarely is it about finance, rarely is it about, you know, a fundamental flaw in a business model, it's about people. And so when we sit up here and we talk about having to find the team that believes in the vision, which, which then necessitates some turnover, that's, that's the ugly part of it. But doesn't it make sense? Isn't it logical that, um, you know, when you, when you think about having to make a change, like, like all of us have had to make in our businesses, it is absolutely critical because leadership is about people, that you get the group of folks that have and share the common vision, can see where you want to take them as the leader, and then, and then you go. And, you know, an unfortunate result of that sometimes is, is change, but I think it's absolutely necessary and it stands to reason. Great. Well, I hope that this was uh, as enjoyable for you as it was for me. I feel honored to have been here with these unbelievable leaders, and I hope you feel the same way, too. And I hope you now have aspirations to be like Bud and Jim and, and Mr. Haverty and, and uh, Mr. Newkirk. So thank you so much, and let's give them a round of applause and thank them so, so much for doing this.